When I was 16, I came home from school and I sat down at the dinner table and I put my head in my hands and I said, you know what, I can't take it anymore. And the problem was that it seemed to me that pretty much everyone around me was unhappy. So I went to a public school in Western Massachusetts. I was in my junior year. Um, and it seemed to me that pretty much all of my friends were going through their days disengaged, not happy, and not learning much. And you know, they, they looked like sort of drones, right? They, 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 they kind of, I'd go, I'd go to school, and they looked like they were being passed through the day by bell after bell, worksheet after worksheet, and then going home to do their homework. They just seemed like lifeless. And that's not to say all the time. You know, they had, there were moments of greatness and a you know, good, good teacher or, or a good project, but most of the time, they just seemed pretty miserable, my friends. And I, I myself, I was pretty happy. I, I, you know, I liked school. I was a, I was a school person. I, you know, I, I had a few teachers I liked. Um, plenty I didn't, but I was pretty content. Um, but what, what was driving me crazy was that so many of my friends just seemed miserable. And I suppose that would have been OK if, in spite of being miserable, they were becoming enlightened. So you know, maybe you just got to buckle down and be unhappy for four years in order to learn, right? But the problem was they didn't really seem to be learning either. They weren't coming out the other end of it with you know, all sorts of knowledge or you know, gaining you know, uh, enlightenment in a way that would allow them to lead better lives or be more thoughtful people or make better decisions. Um, and so, so there was that. And, and even that might have been OK if I just thought, well, you know what, high schoolers suck. I mean, you know, we high schoolers, we, we like to play video games and spend all our time online and, uh, you know, on social media. And, uh, and we're just, we can't really expect high schoolers to learn much, you know? They're just kind of, uh, they're rebels or whatever. But I knew that wasn't the case um, because four, three years previously, when I was a freshman, I had started a garden uh, at my school. Uh, and it was a student-run garden that grew food for the cafeterias in our school district. And in the garden, I saw the opposite of what I saw in the classroom. In the garden, I saw kids showing up at 6 in the morning to harvest vegetables for the cafeteria, not getting credit or money or anything. I saw them giving up their weekends to work, you know, to, to, to harvest and weed and water. I saw them going all through the summer, skipping sports, family dinners, whatever, all of that, because they had committed to this idea of changing the way our school ate. So, I knew that high schoolers had enormous potential, that when they put their minds to something, they, could do, they couldn't be stopped. So that's what really began to eat at me, was the mismatch between the lifeless people I saw in the classroom who couldn't be, you know, who had to be cajoled into just you know, writing their name on a piece of paper, and then the ones I saw getting up at 6 in the morning to go out in the cold and pick raspberries. Um, and that really began to just drive me up the wall. And uh, you know, so that day, I came home and I said, you know, Mom, I, it's so crazy to me. It doesn't make any sense. And I can't take it anymore. And I was expecting her to be like, oh, well, you know, suck it up or whatever. That's life. That's high school. You'll get to college one day, and that'll be fun. Um, but she didn't. She turned to me and said, OK, then why don't you start your own school? Um, and I began to think, OK, maybe I will. Um, and so I started to spend my junior year of high school thinking that I could actually start a school within my high school uh, in Western Massachusetts. And I began to think, well, maybe we could do it differently. What, maybe we could change things so that we could see what I saw in the garden and on the basketball court and in the baseball field. I could, we could see that in the classroom. And the big idea that began to occur to me in my junior year as I started to to plan this and design this new school was that the difference between what I saw in the garden and what I saw in the classroom came down to autonomy. Because in the, in the garden, we were the owners. We, it was our thing. It was our garden. We were responsible for it, and no one was telling us to do it. No one was there to save us from it when things went wrong. It was ours. And in the classroom, uh, you know, 14, us 14 to 18-year-olds, adolescents, becoming adults, 
We had no autonomy. We were being told what to learn, how to learn it, then given a test to be told whether we had learned it or not. Um, so it began to occur to me that it was no wonder that we weren't engaged. It was no wonder that we weren't passionate. It was no wonder that we weren't finding things we were excited about. Because we were at a time in our lives when we craved more than anything autonomy, and yet we were be giving, being given the opposite. We were being, having our lives completely structured within the school day. And so I began to think that I, if I did start a school, it would be a student-run school. OK, I'll tell my side of the story. <laughs> when Sam walked in that day and sat down at the table and put his head in his hands, I mean, he really looked miserable. And he looked furious. But that wasn't the first time I had seen a kid frustrated at school. First of all, Sam is the youngest of my three sons. And they all went to local public school. And I had heard so many stories on so many afternoons, the good thing and the bad thing, you know, the wonderful chance to write a cool story, the terrible time a teacher unfairly graded a test, the victory in a basketball game, and the cool mural painted on a wall, but also the mean teacher who sent you out to the whatever, the bad office. Um, and all along, I thought to myself, OK, you take the bad with the good. Overall, it's a pretty good thing. And it's what it is. It's what high school has to be. On that day when he came home so filled with frustration and so filled with uh, disgust at the dis disparity between what he had seen in the garden and what he had seen um, what he what he's seen at the garden and what he saw pos you know going on in the hallways in his school i had sort of a series of light bulb moments the first light bulb was that we had been distracted as a nation by the idea of the super highs and the super lows. So everybody knows about the desperate stories of children who are so miserable or so marginalized at school that they drop out, that they give up, that they do something terrible. And on the other hand, the super highs, the victorious kids who, against all odds, succeed or do something fantastic. And as a country, we had forgotten to think about the vast middle. We had assumed that that was OK, that as long as you got by, as long as you got a few good grades or one fun basketball game, um, it would be OK. And that that was a terrible mistake, because OK was not good enough. The second light bulb moment I had came from the fact that I'm a developmental psychologist. So I know quite a bit about the most contemporary research on what adolescents are like, what they need, uh, what the pitfalls are. And I realized during that light bulb moment that high school is almost perfectly designed to be the opposite of what high schoolers are like and what they need. And that, in fact, high schools spend most of their time, teachers, administrators, school policy makers, thinking of ways to limit what they see as the potential disasters of adolescence. Whatever you can do to keep kids from running wild, uh, whatever you can do to make them sit in their seat, whatever you can do to keep them from ganging up with each other and doing bad things, and whatever you can do to keep them out of control. And in spending so much energy and time thinking about ways to limit the negative potential of teenagers, they had neglected to think about what you could do to design an environment that would make the most of the incredible potential of the adolescent period of life. Because in fact, it is arguably one of the two most important developmental phases of our whole lives. Maybe sort of infancy and toddlerhood is one where you learn to walk and navigate the social world, and you begin to understand symbols. I mean, an enormous amount goes on then. And then again, in adolescence, this major transformation takes place. And we had sort of ignored it in our high schools. And that led to the third light bulb, which is that, in fact, there is this huge transformation that happens during adolescence. You start high school, you're still pretty much a kid. Um, and in our culture, you're treated like a kid without the freedom of responsibility and also the openness and the privileges of childhood. And yet, by the time you leave high school, we expect you to be well on your way to adulthood. After all, by the time you're 18, you can vote. Uh, you can legally get married. Um, you can, um, you're supposed to be 
somewhere on the path to choosing a professional uh, life or a professional identity, and not to mention the fact that we would happily send you off to fight in a war and kill people and be killed for your country. That's at 18. At 16, we hardly let you do anything. And in fact, as Sam said, we don't even trust you to tell time. We ring a bell when you should get up out of your seat and go to the next activity. And suddenly, it made no sense to me that adolescence should be squandered in that way um, or neglected in that way, which is why I led. I was so interested to watch him develop the school. And in a much less articulate way, I began to be frustrated by all these things, too. Um, and, and it, you know, in my junior year, as I started to think, you know, well, we could have a student-run school. Um, and if we did that, students would be making choices and so therefore engaged and really able to learn things. They could learn to be responsible and learn to, um, you know, to dig deeply into things as, a ro as opposed to just be told to flip from subject to subject. I began to think all these things. It also, it, you know, occurred to me that this, this was all, that we couldn't just, I couldn't just think about it that this actually had to happen. I actually had to start a school. Um, and so that's what I set about doing in my junior year, was going to my school and saying, listen, I'm, I'm going to start a, a student-run school here. And of course, they just said, OK, fine, that, that makes sense, and let me do it. Um, no, so of course, as a public school, it wasn't that easy. They, um, there was a lot of backlash, um, because I said, you know, we, we should start a student-run school. And they said, that's the craziest thing we've ever heard. <laughs> um, and I, but I went, started going through that process, meeting after meeting, curriculum steering committee, school board, parents, teachers, everyone, to try to say, listen, look at how much doesn't make sense about what we do. Look at how much we know about adolescence and what we could achieve if we made some simple changes. Um, but also to say, look, you know, what a, look at what we're doing now. Look how many kids are failing. Look how many kids who are succeeding are getting almost nothing out of this process. Um, and yet still, I got backlash. To give you a little example, uh, in, I don't know, my thousandth meeting with this curriculum steering committee, uh, you know, I was going on saying, well, you know, I, I'd gone to them so many times before. And each time, I, they'd sent me back to the drawing board. And I'd come back to them saying, well, what about this? And what if we do this? And one teacher was getting so frustrated. You know, he was getting red in, visibly red in the face. Um, and uh, finally, late in the meeting, he just blurted out, you know what, it's, it's ridiculous to think that high schoolers could be trusted to learn on their own. Um, and I think that just paints a picture of the kind of response that we got. But meeting after meeting, uh, day after day, month after month, we convinced them to do it. Um, and so in my, the, my senior year, the fall of my senior year, we got eight students from all different backgrounds, kids who were planning to drop out, getting straight Fs, uh, to straight A students who planned to go to the top colleges, uh, to come together and take charge of their high school education. So one of the things that fascinated me, so Sam would come home from school and say, you can't believe it. They said, we can't do this, or it won't work, or the teachers won't let us do it. And I began to notice actually it comes down to a very simple idea, how afraid grown-ups are of teenagers. Um, and I began to think about what was driving that fear. And I'm just going to name a few. One of their fears is that, and I've referred to this before, is that teenagers left to their own devices, left to learn on their own, there will, you'll have total anarchy. Uh, that they won't follow any rules, that they won't have any plans, uh, that they won't do any work. And in fact, all of the research shows, in a famous study where students had little beepers that beeped them all the day, throughout the day to find out what they were doing, who they were with, um, what kind of project they were doing or activity they were doing, what they were feeling and thinking. That research shows that actually, when teenagers have a choice over what they're doing, uh, they are their most engaged, their most purposeful, uh, their most hardworking, and their most interested in taking on serious challenges. So in fact, it's not as if giving students a choice makes them dive into chaos and anarchy. Quite the opposite. It makes them focus. It makes them try hard. Um, as a second example, there's a terrible fear that if teenagers get together, they'll just 
cause a lot of damage, you know. And there's, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of effort put on keeping kids apart from each other. They can have five minutes between classes to walk down the hall, but then they separate. Don't sit too near one another. Uh, you can work a little bit, but don't work together a little bit, but don't work too much because you'll borrow each other's ideas. All of the research shows that when students can work I mean, you must find this here. When students can work with someone they like, they do better work. Uh, when teenagers are in the company of peers, they do take more risks, but many of those risks are good risks. Uh, and in some settings, we see that as one of the goals of education, learning how to take a risk. One of the other things that scared the grown-ups that Sam was talking to was the idea that grown-ups would become useless or irrelevant, because if the teenagers were learning together, uh, what would the grown-ups do? Um, in fact, we know from research that the most important role, adults are very important during adolescent development. We, we've known this since Eric Erickson in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, teenagers need adult role models that are not their parents. Uh, but actually, ch by changing the role, which I think Sam is going to tell you a little more about, by changing the role of adults, you free them from being minders and keepers and disciplinarians, and you find a way to let them actually be mentors and develop mutual relationships. That's what the research shows teenagers need, relationships with grown-ups, um, not to be watched over. Finally, one of the fears that the grown-ups had uh, in Sam's school, and grown-ups ever since, as we've talked about this idea, is that if you took them out of the regular conventional school system, they'd miss something very important. That how would they keep up with their English or their math or whatever it is that the conventional um, school was offering them. It was such a, it might create such a gap in their education. And what's remarkable about that, if you look across the country at the data we have about schools, is that it turns out they wouldn't be missing very much at all. Uh, the data on what kids learn in a given semester or year are not very impressive. And the less a kid likes the school, the less impressive their learning is. Um, so in fact, I, it's hard for me to understand quite what, why grown-ups feel so much fear at the idea of students choosing their own education. Um, and I, I think what we, one thing that happened that, that semester was we showed how many of those fears were unfounded. Um, so we set out in the fall of my senior year um, and ran our own school. And the setup was simple. We had our afternoon set aside for an individual endeavor, which meant that you could do anything you wanted as long as it could take the, you know, the whole time. It was meaty uh, and you were excited to do it. Build a boat, write a book, whatever. Um, and in the mornings we did academics. Uh, so we did sciences where you ask questions. Um, and, uh, and the, the languages, the mathematical and, and English languages, where we read books, chose books for each other, wrote, read, read our reading aloud to each other, and explored exciting math problems. Um, and uh, to, to, to paint a little picture of what that was like, um, I'll tell you a story from that, that first, um, that, that, that the very beginning of that school. Um, so we started out with the science, doing the sciences in the morning. Um, and the idea was everyone would come up with their own natural and social science question to start the week. And then you'd spend that week pursuing the answer, reading books, talking to teachers, experts, whatever. Um, and then on Friday, you'd teach it to the rest of the group. And as we started out, it was really exciting. You know, everyone was get, you know, coming up with their questions. Oh, I, I want to know, you know why crying evolved. Or I want to you know, know, um, you know what, what really initiated World War II, that, that kind of stuff. And, um, and yet there was one student who I was worried about. You know, we were just getting started. I just spent an entire year convincing my school and everyone that we could do this. But I didn't know. I mean, it could have been a disaster, <laughs> and it would all be on me. So I, there, I was nervous. Um, and there was one student who had, you know, his older brother dropped out. He, he was planning to drop out. He didn't do well in class. His teachers, he didn't, he didn't get along with his teachers. And I was worried. You know, he was in those first weeks, he was sort of sitting there um, looking kind of grumpy and disinterested. And I was worried, you know, what if he just doesn't do anything? What if they're right? What if, you know, when they said, oh, some kids just don't have interests, they were right. Um, and so that, that first day of, uh, of uh, question asking, um, you know, everyone had gone, and it got to Rick's, who's the, who's the kid. 
um, and he just didn't say anything. And everyone, you know, and everyone was like, Rix, what about you, man? And he's like, don't, get, don't have anything. And, you know, Tim was like, well, come on, we all thought of questions over the weekend. You got, you got to have something. And, and he's like, nope. And, uh, and then, you know, another student said, well, well, you must be interested in something. What are you interested in? And he said, nope, not interested in anything. And I was like, oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I was wrong. <laughs> um, and then his friend, uh, surprisingly, who was someone who I never would have guessed would be the person to speak up, because he was also someone who didn't like school. And, um, he said, well, what about that book you were looking at earlier? That Sam, you know, that copy of Sam's book. You were looking at that. You must have been pretty interested in that. And I was like, what book is he talking about? I mean, and then I remembered. I was reading A Brief History of Time. And, uh, and, and Rick said, well, yeah, I mean, I guess, like infinity and space and stuff. That's, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> and I was, I was hit with two different emotions at once. I, I thought, I was so excited that, that Rick's was interested in something. I was like, yes, great. And then I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Too bad it's something so impossibly complex <laughs> that he could never you know, make any progress on it. And for a split second, I thought about saying, you know, well, maybe not, not for this first week. Maybe, you know, what do you think? You should try something else. And then I thought, you know what? That's, that's not the point of this. You know, the point of this is for people to pursue their interests. I don't want to make him decide he's not interested. Um, and, and so I didn't say anything. And the week went along. And everyone else, I'd see, you know, uh, John, you know, racing off with a stack full of books, you know, to the library, or uh, Dakota coming in with muddy boots and a bag full of leaves that she had collected. Um, and yet, day by day, I saw Rick sitting in the corner, you know, with the same textbook in the same spot on the same page, uh, look, you know, over and over again. And I was just, uh, you know, and and I, I worried. Um, and one day, uh, I, you know, I came over. I went over to. Uh, oh, so, so, one, so one day I noticed that my book was missing, um, my brief history of time. And I saw Rick's at lunch, and he said, yo, I borrowed your book. And I was like, OK. Oh, well, what do you think? You know, and he's like, I don't know. It's confusing. <laughs> and, and I was like, well, you, you want to talk about it? I mean, yeah, I, I, when I read it, I, I couldn't really. I've had to read it two times. I, it's, you know, I find it pretty confusing, too. I don't really get it. And, and, uh, and he's like, no, nah, not really. I don't want to talk about it. And then Friday came. And we had our very first day of teaching. Um, and everyone stood up there and taught us. And you know, John scribbled the chalkboards, covered them with notes. And uh, you know, um, Dakota dumped her bags of leaves and explained the hypothesis she had. Um, and I sat there just amazed. I'd never seen kids look so excited and engaged standing at the front of a classroom. And, but all along, I sat there thinking, well, what's going to happen when Rex goes? And finally, it was his turn, and everyone turned to him. And um, you know, he had his, his pants were uh, sagging down, and and he sort of said, he sort of said with a smile, he was like, "Well, I, I guess I'm supposed to go now, huh?" And he stood up, and he sort of tucked his hat low over his eyes, so we couldn't really see his face. And he went up there, and he pulled out a rubber band, and he said, "So I'm going to explain something to you called a Mobius strip." And if I was surprised to hear the term Mobius strip coming out of <laughs> Rick's mouth, I only had to wait and listen. Um, because for the next 40 minutes, he began to talk. And he said, so you can use this rubber band uh, to understand. You know, and, he, and he launched into it. And uh, you, know, you could have heard a pin drop. Or you, you know, we, we barely moved in that whole time. And he finally explained about the Big Bang. Um, and then. You know, and he said, and, and, and then he tried to explain the difference between finite and infinite universes. And he said, you know, that part's, that part's real hard to explain. I, I tried to explain to my, my bro yesterday, and he didn't really get it. So, I, you know, I don't, I don't think, I don't really even get it anymore. So, or yeah, <laughs> like, so, uh, you know, this might not make any sense, but there's this hotel, and it's kind of like an infinite hotel. Um, and, I, you know, I don't know who started it, but pretty soon we were all clapping. Um, and, uh, and, you know, Rick was embarrassed, but he was smiling. 
So when he, when Sam would come home from school, he'd talk about the different kids in the independent project and tell me who they were and what they were doing. And when he started talking about Rick's, you know, the scraggly guy who was not doing well in school, I. I love boys, I got three boys, so I thought, oh my God, he's probably this great kid and no one understands him and once again, teachers aren't giving some boy a fair shake. And then one day I was in school to watch a basketball game or something and this really grungy looking boy with lank hair and low pants and sort of flumped over and not nice looking at all, came up with Sam and said, Sam called me over and said, Mom, this is Rick's. Rick's, this is my mom. And I couldn't believe it, because I thought, this is Rick's? This isn't the kid I thought I would love and that I thought all the teachers would love. In fact, I don't think I would love him if I were his <laughs> teacher. Um, and he reminded me, this story reminds me of the same old story I've heard again and again of a kid who didn't seem like academic material. He wasn't appealing to grown-ups. He prob I knew, as I found out later, he was from a family where there were no readers or no talkers. He probably had parents who hated school or even dropped out of school, so he never expected to like school. And he made teachers expect that they wouldn't like him. He's the kind of kid that teachers look at and think, this kid is not academic material. And the next thought they have is the big mistake in teaching, which is they think this kid is not going to do well academically, so this kid must not be a thinker. And that's one of the great flaws, uh, great mistakes we make, which is to assume that just because a kid doesn't look like he's going to do well in school, he must not be a thinker. The fact is we know from a great deal of research that every single child is born a thinker. Everybody loves to think about the world around them. Um, I just heard today a conversation about two little five-year-olds having a heated argument in the back of their car about the space-time continuum. That's not unusual. Uh, and in the first years of life, every kid is a learner. As I said, they learn to talk, they learn to navigate the social world, they learn all kinds of rules and complex um, topics. As they go on in school, for many children, a kid like Rick's, that begins to be worn away because they're taught that if they're not doing well, they can't think about good big topics. And Sam, in the moment that he struggled with Rick's topic, suffered from the same kind of doubt that teachers often suffer from, which is when he thought to himself, this might be too complicated for Rick's, it's because he had the impulse that if you struggle academically, we should give you something easier to work on. Because better to be successful at something easy than struggle with something hard. The mistake there is to equate easy and hard with boring and interesting. Because often the easy tasks we give kids who struggle are also boring tasks. No one likes to work at something that's boring. And the, you know, we, we turn knowledge into a ladder where all the boring stuff is at the bottom, but you've got to do it to get to the good stuff at the top. But if you're a kid in school, whether you're 8 or 14, uh, why are you going to want to get past that bottom rung of the ladder? Who is one, going to want to get to infinity if they have to learn the number line first and the number line is difficult? Um, much better to get interested in infinity and then decide that you'll never understand it completely if you don't find out more about the number line. What Sam and Ricks discovered together in the, in the time they sat together had to do with the realizing that everybody is wading into the unknown when they delve into new ideas, that everybody wants to think about big ideas. Um, you know, we know this, by the way, from listening to te what teenagers talk about when they're not in school or write songs about um, or like to go to movies about. They like to think about love and justice and conflict. Uh, they're interested in the big ideas. And you don't need to know a lot about something to begin to think about it. When Sam said to Ricks, I don't really get it either, he was making them an intellectual team, and he was 
inviting Ricks into the pleasures of the unknown. So for Ricks, that period of time when he struggled to grasp, the infin grasp infinity um, was his first most authentic experience of being a true intellectual. And that's what school should provide every teenager. Um, and so, yeah, so we, we carried on that year. Um, we, in our afternoons, we, we learned what it was like to really master something. In the mornings, we discovered what it was like to, to be, all be intellectuals together. Um, and at the end of it, we did something called the Collective Endeavor, uh, which was planned in for the last three or four weeks of the program. The idea being that in school, we get almost no time to truly collaborate. We get to do like a project here or there where two people team up to make a poster or something, but we don't get to make something together, to build something as a team. Um, and the other element of the collective endeavor is that it had to have an impact on our community. Because somehow we were supposed to emerge from school you know, being better citizens, and yet we almost never engage with the outside world. Um, and so in the end, we had to choose something to do together as a team that would have a positive impact on our community. Um, and uh, Maybe unsurprisingly, when I turned to everyone and we, we, or we all turned to each other and decided, you know, what are we going to talk about? Everyone immediately said, we've got to do something about education. Because what they had discovered, they wanted to share with every other high schooler in the world. Um, and so uh, we, we made a film about what we had done in our year in education. Um, and uh, we, we posted it online. Um, and we expected, you know, maybe uh, our, one of our parents would watch it, or uh, you know, I a friend or something. <laughs> and um, but people started to watch it, and people started to write to us and say, "Hey, uh, you know, I want to do this too." You know, teachers, parents, and most excitingly, other students, saying like, "You know, I, school's miserable for me too. I want to get excited. You know, I want to <laughs> discover what it's like to love learning." Um, and and then it, it, you know that year ended. Um, I went off to college. Uh, I moved to England. Um, the independent project, which was the name of the school, carried on. Uh, it's now in its seventh year. Um, you know, Ricks uh, graduated. He didn't drop out. And uh, he, his individual endeavor was learning how to cook. He's now uh, a chef at a top restaurant. Um, and others went on to college and to pursue careers and the things that they had discovered. Um, and my mom and I carried on talking. <laughs> um, and we uh, carried on the conversations uh, that started that first time at the dinner table when I sat down and said, I can't take this anymore. Uh, and eventually, those conversations turned into this book. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if you want to say anything about the book, but uh, yeah. So that the, the, I want you to read it. <laughs> <laughs> so those conversations turned into that book. And the book was, you know, was a few things. It, it was, it was like I said, the, the ideas that began to form because, you know, we we realized this wasn't just one instance at one school, but this was a new way of thinking about how we could educate our young people. Um, the book's also the story, the nitty gritty of what that was like, the ups and downs, the failures, the great moments, the bad moments, the things we did right and the things we did wrong. Uh, but maybe most importantly, or most excitingly. Uh, the book's also a how-to, because all those people wrote to us from you know, New York City to Boise, Idaho, to Australia, to Spain, you know, saying, uh, we want to do this. So it's, it's, it's a how-to for you know, how you can change your own school. Um, and maybe for me, uh, I don't know, most of all, you know, this may not be the case for my mom, but um, it's about what that teacher said that day when we were first starting out. When that teacher said, you know, it's ridiculous to think that high schoolers could be trusted to learn on their own. And that, that year in education and everything, you know, that happened after really is about the fact that it's ridiculous to think that they can't. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Hi. So how would you talk about the conventional system like colleges accepting this kind of education system, and uh, how do, do you relate to admissions of colleges? What's the path if somebody pursues it? So I'll answer from the perspective of what we did uh, in the, in, I don't know if I need to repeat the question or if it's recorded, okay. So um, I'll answer from the perspective of what we did in the independent project and then 
uh, as a college professor, <laughs> um, uh, you know, we we conveyed it as 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 you as is often done with sort of things that are done sort of outside the traditional path. So, uh, in they got everyone who did it gets credits um, equivalent to the time that they you know the first semester's worth of credits or whatever it is, uh, and then there is a actually at our school we also now send out a letter at the front of their sort of admissions package saying, uh, you know, this thing is this different. We have a student run school at our school now. Um, and, uh, and giving a sense that, you know, these kids did something different. And interestingly enough, uh, maybe, you know, this wasn't something we expected, but it turns out that almost every kid who's done it writes about like their individual endeavor or, or at least the program in their college essay. Because for most of the people who did it, it becomes the thing that they're passionate about. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's an interesting piece. So I'll give you two parts to the answer. Uh, I teach at Williams College, which is a very selective college. Um, and uh, uh, my experience is that when students, good students do really interesting things in high school, it only helps their college application process. That said, I honestly don't think that's the reason to encourage your kid to do this if you're a grown up asking the question, because the whole point of this was that what a terrible travesty to squander a kid's for those precious, incredibly transformative, powerful years, thinking about what comes next. You know, Alfie Cohen, the educator, has this line, I know he's been out here in the Palo Alto area to talk about this, where he says, how much damage are you willing to do to your child to ensure that they get into a marginally better college? And I, I think that's well, well, point well said, <laughs> taken. Um, but I would also say more broadly that one of the things that was most exciting about the, is most exciting about the Independent Project is its firm commitment to the idea that kids of all backgrounds and abilities can learn together, that they can be intellectuals together, that that's for everybody. Uh, and one reason I bring that up is many of the kids who thrive in this kind of environment, some are the kids who are going to go to a great college anyway, and many of them from the Independent Project have, they would either way. Many of them might not go to college at all if they weren't in the independent project. And then the question isn't, isn't which is the best college they're going to get into, but can you get them to want to go to college? Sure. Can you get them to see that learning is something they want to pursue? And I would end by saying, again, as a teacher at, a, at an elite institution, that it's my dream come true to get students who get there, not only because they have tall aspirations in terms of external success or money, but who actually come there with a hunger to learn. Um, so I, I don't see it as having really any downside in terms of the path to college. So is there a grading scale? Do you take tests uh, when you apply to colleges, when they're asking for transcripts? How do you measure that someone actually learns something through the independent project? Um. Again, I'll take a stab at it and then see what she says. But um, <laughs> she'll say the more interesting thing. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think in general, our approach is that the design of the system brings the best out of kids and that the experience. I mean, one of the things that's, that's so amazing is that we did awesome things. We read more books than we had ever read in our entire, you know, we, people realized they loved science, you know, all these incredible things. But even if, that hadn't happened, even if things had gone wrong. The experience of being responsible for our, our own and each other's education was totally transformative and something we never would have gotten. So there are certain elements of it that, that can't go wrong. I mean, they're responsible for it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so that said, it was, it was, uh, it was pass fail. Um, they either got the credits or they didn't. Um, and, and yeah, there are other questions. So certainly there were no grades, there were no tests. That was not the point. Um, and the, the, we had constant sort of measurement and feedback. So we criticized each other on Friday, and we, you know, uh, we had to present our individual endeavors, uh, but nothing like a sort of point, right? Yeah, I'll say something about measurement. Um, because 
something I'm very interested in through the whole K-12 spectrum. Uh, we all suffer from this delusion that uh, the numbers that we're used to seeing as measures of the educational process mean something. Very few of them mean anything, except that if you get a high score when you're little, you're likely to get a high score when you're older. They, they mean it, it means itself. Um, and uh, so the problem with that is once you buy into that, you, it's, you, the rest of it seems so fuzzy. And I will say that I think uh, a second mistake is to think that if you reject bad measures, it means you reject all measures. I think we need good measures of the kinds of educational outcomes that, that Sam found his way to in the school. And there is every reason to believe we could come up with those measures. I, I always say, you know, I'm a psychologist. So we measure all kinds of things. We measure unconscious stereotype, the impulse to gamble, uh, love. Uh, so the idea that we couldn't measure things like your knowledge of books, your real knowledge of books, or your ability to teach yourself something new, or your ability to ask a good question, which they spent a lot of time doing, is silly. We could measure those things. And then maybe we'd offer that as a different measurement uh, of what we're doing. So I think that remains to be done and is begging to be done. Uh, my name's George. I uh, used to be a teacher. Uh, Hi. Spent two years uh, in, the, in the city of Chicago. Um, a, a, few, a few thoughts and, and, and then a question. One is uh, when I was teaching in Chicago, uh -huh. uh, it was all boys charter school. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, we were obviously very obsessed with measurement, uh, mm -hmm. like all schools, uh, because uh, that ties to how much funding we get. Uh, you know, who's going to get, you know, is the right. principal is going to keep mm -hmm. his or her job. Um, and, uh, and a lot of schools, they have a zero tolerance uh, policy on discipline. So mm -hmm. there's, it's very strict, like what you can do, uh, what you cannot do in, in terms of behavior. Um, which is very different from what you described. Um, the second thing is uh, what I have seen, uh, I moved here uh, from Chicago, and what I have seen here uh, in the Bay Area, it's very striking uh, because um, I don't know if I want to, I, I, don't, I don't have, I'm single, I don't have kids, but uh, I, I, I'm not sure if I, if I do have kids, I want to raise my kids here because kids from very early age, you know, they are already preparing for Stanford and Berkeley, right? They need to get the, the mm. scores. Uh, they are in all these classes, um, you know, extracurricular activities, uh, trying to have a, a chance. And it's very competitive here to get into a good school uh, in the Bay Area, um, which is also very different from <laughs> what you described. Um, so I'm just wondering, obviously, you know, we, we uh, Right now, uh, where we are, we can uh, using use your your system right away. But what are some of the tangible different uh, changes uh, that you know we can do right now? Maybe have some kind of hybrid system or any changes we can make right now uh, to our system. One thing I also want to add is I I, I went to University of Michigan and um, uh, one of the best program I attend best educational experience was we, it's called New England Literature Program. We in, went into the woods mm. for six weeks. Huh. No, no electronic device. We had to turn in our cell phone, laptop, no heat, no internet. Live there, uh, read books, poetry, hiking, go to national parks, no shower, jump into the lake. Best educational experience ever. Um, but I know that's also not realistic. Um, you know, to, for everyone to do that right away. And why not? Um, because, you know, uh, Google is probably gonna, not going to hire people to <laughs> jump into the lake. Uh, they want to see your resume. <laughs> so I'd uh, love to get your thoughts yeah. on, you know, what we can do right now. Thank cool. you. Um, I don't know if we're on the same page on this, so I'll answer. Uh, and it's a pretty simple answer, um, which is that you said that, that, that you can't, but you should. Um, I mean, not you, this, the schools here should. Um, because the point of this was that I think what we're doing is wrong. Uh, I think that most of the conventional school is making a lot of mistakes, and it's not edu educating our young well, um, and it's, 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 it's wasting their time. Um, 
I think that, that there's a real danger. I mean, a lot of times when, when we were first pitching this and, and since, uh, people, you know, when we were first pitching it, people said, well, that's, that's a great idea, but let's just do it for a period, you know, because they've still got to go to their AP class and, uh, or let's just do it after school. Um, and this is, this is not about tinkering. Um, it's about rebuilding. Um, and I, don't, I think we have to, whatever it takes. I, it certainly won't be easy. Um, uh, but we have to begin being ready to make big changes. Um, and uh, yeah, that's. So I'm going to disappoint you. We <laughs> are on the same page. I'm going to add one concrete piece of advice. Because as I was listening to you talk about these kids who were doing all these after school things and trying so hard, I was imagining the kind of question that Sam asked the kids around him when he was designing the independent project which is if you brought a group of those kids together and said, if you could spend the next period of time learning in whatever way you wanted, or if you could learn whatever you wanted, what would it be? You might be surprised. They might choose to study or embark on some pretty impressive uh, ventures. Teenagers are not without ambition. It just may be a different kind of ambition than what a the adults right around them expect them to have. But they have aspirations. They have desire. They have uh, great interest. And so I, if I were a teacher in this community, or a parent, or had any access to kids, I'd start very simply. I'd get a group of kids together and say, what is it you really want to do during this period of time that will take you forward, that will be meaningful to you? That turns out it's a scarier question than I ever thought. I didn't think it was a big deal when I said, so start your own. Uh, but I agree with Sam. I can't imagine what would stop people from at least asking that question. This, these are supposed to be student-led uh, schools. So even if a student doesn't come up with the idea, the role a grown-up can play is to invite the student to think in that way. And that's just a question. You alluded to a little earlier about the the role that grown-ups can play yeah. and how they become better mentors, et cetera. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little yes. bit. Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, the idea, uh, the, the role we in, uh, I envisioned for adults um, was not being sort of the lecturer at the front of the room, um, but actually sort of being embedded within the students. Because certainly we need you know teachers as sources of expertise, sources of support developing relationships with adults so that they can model to us what it's like to both do good, you know, to be good intellectually, but also as, as a person and as a citizen. Um, and that not only, that everyone will benefit from that process if they're not sort of the taskmaster. Uh, you know, uh, my girlfriend's a teacher, my cousin's a teacher, um, and they spend so much of their time having to, to babysit, to be taskmasters. And it's a waste of their time and it's a waste for the kids. Um, and so the idea is that they would um, be doing the work, you know, model what it's like to ask a good question and pursue the answer and teach, to give criticism alongside with the students, um, uh, all of that, you know, as a, as a coach more than a, a, um, a, le a lecturer or a sage on the stage. Um, in that first year of the Independent Project, you know, uh, we pitched this idea and the school finally said, okay, um, but no teacher time. Um, and so we didn't get that. We had to get a few teachers to volunteer, sort of s sneak their time in to, you know, to spend time with us when they could. Um, likewise, the school said, OK, fine, but you don't get a space. Uh, so that first year, we were in the coach's office at the girls' locker room. Um, but anyway, that's what we got. And, and, but what I envisioned was this new role for teachers, which is harder. It's harder. It's easier to give a lecture than to learn how to not, you know, to, to lead in sort of as the, um, to lead from behind, basically. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I'll just echo what Sam said, that I think that to work with students in that way is fascinating, and it's very difficult to do. Um, I, I'm intrigued by the idea. So he had this incredible advisor that year who, when he came to him with the idea, said something like, OK, what can I do to help? Taking that seriously as the beginning of your role as a teacher is a, is a fascinating one. What it would take, I mean, I'm intrigued by the question of what it would take to train a group of teachers to be good at that role. And I'm, you know, check back with me in a year or two. I'm just thinking about what would that guy say about how he did it if he was teaching other people to do that. So I do think it's hard. 
And I can tell you as a college teacher, I know the difference between the two. Sometimes I do one and sometimes I do the other, but I can tell you which one I love a lot more and mm -hmm. which one leads to a lot better learning when I'm leading from behind. Um, I have a question from the Dory, which you guys kind of briefly touched upon, but I think there, um, Emerson wants a little bit more clarity, and it's around students transitioning into college. Um, so I'm assuming even after maybe admissions, right, and transitioning into college where maybe it is still a little bit more structured. Um, so from your guys' perspective, how do you see your school in helping a, a student transition into college and be successful there? Okay. Um, good question. Uh, I've got two parts to the answer. Uh, one is that, funnily enough, that was turned out, in the, in the beginning, the big concern when I was pitching this idea was like, whoa, that's crazy, kids will burn the building down or something. But after they started saying yes, and it was like hashing out details, the biggest concern became, because it was only for that for fall semester. So spring semester, they had to go back into regular classes. And everyone became totally terrified about the transition. And they would talk about it like, you know, what about the transition back into? <laughs> um, and the funny thing, I mean, the funny, there are various things that are funny about that. One is, you know, what are you doing in school so that if the, everyone leaves for a semester, when they come back, you think it'll be a disaster? You know, something's wrong with a system where you can't step away and come back into it, right? Um, and then also amazingly, surprisingly, um, when they did have to transition back in, it went really smoothly. In fact, everyone got better grades than they had done in the rest of high school. And that wasn't the point of the program, was to get them to get better grades. We didn't care. None of us cared. Um, and despite the fact that everyone dreaded going back, because they dreaded being in a situation where they weren't excited and they weren't really learning much. They, what they said, at least, was that the reason they were getting better grades was because they had learned these tools in the independent project to you know, find the bit of the class that they could pursue and make more interesting for themselves, or you know, to thrive off of the more able kid in the class, any, you know, things like that, or to teach each other that the skills they learned had made them better. And I, the same is true for college. You know, you're not going to you're not going to fall apart by having been independent or be, you know, work with a student. You're not going to get to college and then be like, I don't know how to learn anymore. In fact, it's the opposite. You will learn skills so that when you're a bit more independent in college than you are in high school, you're going to be even better off. And then finally, I can speak from experience. You know, uh, I went off to college, um, and uh, and so I couldn't believe how many, how often. I found myself thinking, you know, thank God I had that time in the independent project. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> so I'll just add to that that, again, as a college professor, the bane of our existence, and I speak here for many of my colleagues, is the question, uh, what were you looking for in this paper? Or what did you want? What kind of answer did you want when you asked this question? By the time students get to college, what we professors want them to say is, this is what I want to write about. This is what I want to learn about. Um, and we wish that they were a little less focused on figuring out what the test maker wanted in the test and a little more on, what do I want to get from that book or, or that lecture or that experience. So uh, I, the more that students can learn to be self-directed learners before they get to us, the more fully they can make use of college. I have a couple just like logistical questions about where the project, where Project Independent is today in terms of how many people are participating. Is it still just a fall quarter during their senior year? Is it a longer program? And then also, um, how do people, do they choose to get into the program? Do they have to apply if there reaches a certain number? Do you have different cohorts? Just kind of how does it look today? The size has varied from around 8 to 12. Um, the, the element of being a team, being an intellectual community, is essential. And so it needs to be groups. It can't be you know, 300 students mashed together, because you get so much out of having a mixed ability, the whole range of ability students being responsible for each other's education. Um, what I would like is for there to be 10 of those groups, or 50, you know, not one. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, it still only runs for one semester. Uh, and again, I think that it would benefit so much from being a year. I mean, one of the things we had to deal with was a sort of deorientation period. I mean, we got there, and that first day, the bells went off, and everyone stood up to start shuffling their papers. And then we were like, wait, we've got nowhere to go. I mean, and that just <laughs> captures you know, so much. We had been taught to be completely dependent on teachers 
you know, and we had to learn how to be dependent on ourselves and each other. You know, we had been uh, taught that we didn't have any interests. And so people like Rick's had to discover that they could have interests. You know? So there was this long period of, and I remember feeling so frustrated because by the end of it, when we were just, we, you know, every, people couldn't be stopped. They were flying off to the library and you know, going off to their individual endeavors. I thought, man, imagine if we had had more time. Think of what it would be like at the end of the year. Um, anyway, so I think it should be a year or something. Um, and I guess, and I may have missed a piece of it, so um, let me know if I haven't. But I, but I think the, the point is, uh, there are ways in which it should grow. And, and if other people try it, you know, do it that way. Do it for a year. Try it, or try it different ways. Um, but there is still an incredible amount of resistance. I, every summer when I go back home to visit my family, I wonder if, you know, finally the ridiculous to think people will have sort of put a stomp on it. <laughs> Um, and there are still parents who are, whose kids want to do it but are too worried about them getting into college, despite you know, the fact that kids have gone on to Harvard and you know, wherever. Um, and so anyway, so that's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Did I miss a, a, a there, there is an application process. Oh, yeah. And finally, that, yeah. Um, the application process. Uh, so the idea is it works for everyone. So anyone who wants to do it can do it. Uh, the process that, that we did, that I came up with, but it could be sort of anything, um, it was three questions. Uh, uh, if you could spend six months doing anything you wanted or working on anything you wanted, what would you do? List all of the uses for a stick. Uh, and uh, what's a time when you've worked with other people and it hasn't gone well? But the point of that was to let them know the kind of thing they were getting into. This is going to be different, and it's going to be your time. So, um, Because it's important that this is for everyone but you, gotta, you don't want to do it. If you don't want to do it, no, one, you know, no one's going to force you. That would be silly. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.